welcome to Keith United Methodist Church. We welcome you in the sanctuary, and we welcome those who are also visiting with us online. Can you believe today is the first day of fall? <laughs> it just doesn't, it's not right, but it will be, it will be. We'll have fall weather uh, eventually, eventually. Glad everybody's here today. We do have a few announcements. You'll find them in your bulletin. The first one. Scotty and Lisa have remembered two very special people, Fanny and Walter Ellis, by giving the flowers today. Um, they were always here at Keith, always faithful, and such uh, lovers of our Lord. So thank you, Scotty and Lisa. Um, today we're going to host the Safe Sanctuaries training. It'll be at 1230 to 2 o'clock in Insminger Hall. I uh, understand if you had training two years ago, you don't need to come, but it might be good to have a refresher. So anyway, join them uh, today. Also, I know it's a while away, but we know how time goes. So October the 13th, we're having a joint uh, time of fellowship. It'll be in the gathering. And uh, Jason Gaddis will be back. Jason was the first one that started our gathering. Uh, preaching in there, and so that will be a glorious time to come together <clears throat> on October the 13th. That'll be at 10 o'clock. Uh, also, if you haven't already, please sign the bicentennial uh, parchment. You'll find one in the office and one right outside here on the north end. Uh, it's always fun for me, uh, what was it, 25 years ago when we had our celebration, and to go down the hall, and those are all framed. And I can see my children's handwriting on there when they were younger and uh, people that I have loved that have been in the church for years that now have passed. Uh, so please take time to sign that if you haven't already. This Wednesday at 515, and then there's many activities and um, lessons after that. So please plan to come. I think, what has she got? Baked chicken and vegetables. Sounds good. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. okay, at this time, we will turn our hearts to worship as the acolytes bring the light into the sanctuary. <laughs>
bulletin, our opening prayer, we'll be reading that in unison. Holy God, we thank you for the example of Jesus who made prayer the bedrock of his life and taught us to do the same. Through prayer, he received strength to choose faithfulness rather than give in to temptation. Through prayer, he remained connected to you and was sustained by your spirit for the task of ministry. Through prayer, he healed, taught, forgave, and called. Through prayer, he met the trials of life and grace, refusing to act in anger, blame, or condemnation. Merciful Savior, grant us a deep desire for prayer as we seek to follow Christ's example. Amen. Now if you'll turn in your hymnals to page 380 and stand, we'll be singing together. There's within my heart a melody. and turn to 885. We'll be reciting together the modern affirmation. 885. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith 
let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom and power and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfaithful. Even the Holy Spirit, and we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of our We believe that his face should manifest itself. Of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon earth. Friends, as we come together this morning to share our joys and our concerns, I trust that we not only pray for them here, but I trust that you carry these uh, concerns and these joys with you throughout the week and uh, in your prayer um, time at home that, that you lift up these joys and these concerns it's been a hard week here at the church. Uh, we've lost two of our saints uh, this week. So uh, I trust that you'll be praying for uh, the family of Eleanor Harwick. Uh, she was 102 years old, and uh, she died on, um, I think it was on Thursday uh, of this week, or Wednesday uh, or Thursday that, that we lost her. So uh, if you would be praying for uh, Eleanor's family, and then we found out on, on Thursday that uh, we, la we lost Ambrose Stewart Havey uh, as well uh, on Wednesday. So if you'd be uh, praying for Ambrose's uh, family and friends, um, these are, are two big losses for our church. But I know that uh, you will uh, be praying for their families and, and all those who, who love them. So uh, please keep their families in your prayers. Are there other concerns that, that you would lift up this morning that we can be praying for? All right, Lee Dockery, who is David's uh, brother-in-law, um, we've been praying for him. He's been on hospice care for many months. Um, family of, of Lee Dockery will be praying for you. Lisa. So Darlene Wade, her sister Katie died. Peggy, all right. Darlene Wade. There are other concerns that we can mention this morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, did not realize that, Miss Alma. Linda Stalen, a longtime member here at, at Keith, died on the 14th. Uh, we just found out about that yesterday. So if you would uh, remember the family of Linda Stalen. Longtime member here at, at Keith. Friends, we've got um, some joys to celebrate this morning. If you will look off to my left over here in the transepts, you will see some beautiful, beautiful women from the Terabella Assist Assisted Living uh, Center. They are here to worship with us this morning. And ladies, it is so good to have you with us. Keith uh, leads a worship service at Terabella every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, and they chose to come to us this time and, and wanted to, to worship with us. If you look to the very left-hand side over there on the front row, 
Uh, you will see Miss Marilyn Rowden, a longtime member here at Keith. So, um, <laughs> Marilyn, I know people will be flooded over there to, uh, to see you after church. So, uh, it is good to have all of y'all here uh, worshiping with us. Y'all bring so much joy to, uh, to us this morning uh, being here. And so thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning here at Key. Are there other joys that we can mention this morning? Sam. <laughs> Curtis and Michelle Crafton have finished uh, their uh, work in Hawaii and are coming home later this week. And evidently, the, the care of their house plants are, are still in good hands. So uh, Sam and Stella have been in responsible for the house plants, and uh, they're still alive. So that is good news. Thanks to the Roberts for that. <laughs> Other joys. <laughs> Everybody is happy this morning, a little sleepy. But uh, everybody's happy about a, a big win th last night. Thank you, Tommy, for that reminder. Bobby? All right. If there's nothing else, let us prepare our hearts this morning as we go to God in prayer. Holy God, what a wonderful day it is, a day that you have given us, a day of life, a day of worship, a day of coming together as your people here in this sanctuary to worship you, to lift up your name, to be together, to encourage each other. God, we are grateful for this time. We're especially uh, grateful for the women of Terabella that have joined us here and have uh, just made our, our morning and, and joining us in worship, and we pray a, a special blessing on their life as you uh, continue to watch over them, as you continue to care for them. We are so grateful for this church that you have brought each of us here, and, and you have heard the concerns, you have heard the joys. God, you have heard the pain of of losing three saints of the church in this week. And we pray especially that you be with uh, the family and, and the friends of those that we have lost. For the friends of Linda and Eleanor and, and Ambrose, that you would surround them with your love, with your care, with your compassion, God, with your peace. Let them know that in the pain that they are feeling and the grief, that there is hope in, in a relationship with you. That God, in the loss that they're feeling with this person not being with them, that you are the one that is walking beside them with faithfulness. God, we are grateful for the joys that you bring us in life, that you restore our life every day, that you give us the hope of new life. We're grateful for the forgiveness that you offer to us that is uh, undeserved, that there's nothing that we can do to earn your love, and yet, God, we freely receive it. So would you forgive us for when we fail you and we hurt one another? Would you forgive us in the ways that we continue to learn and we continue to um, mature as your disciples? And we are grateful for the example of Jesus who gives us a deeper desire to learn to pray, to learn to uh, serve, to learn to live as your people here on earth. And God, as your people this morning, we pray a prayer that are not just words, but it's more than words. But we say a prayer that you taught your disciples to pray.
pray. And we pray this morning by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we continue to worship this morning by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. As we give our offerings this morning, we will be singing the hymn number 99 in your hymnal, My Tribute. So if you want to grab the hymnal in one hand and the offering plate in the other hand, we encourage you to sing this morning as we give our tithes and our offerings to God. They would be multiplied in your world today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
you stand as you're able this morning for the reading of the gospel? Coming uh, this morning out of Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. Jesus says, And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you go, whenever you pray, go into your secret room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you. Whenever you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debts. And do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people. You may be seated. So an easy question for you this morning, a softball question is what it would be. Who taught you how to pray? Your parents? Who taught you how to pray? Sunday school teacher? Mother? Grandmother? If you could put in your head an image of seven-year-old Melissa Smith in a long, frilly dress, Patent leather shoes. I know, right? It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Patent leather shoes. Really dress every Sunday. My parents would make us go to church. And every Sunday it would be a frilly dress and patent leather shoes. To this day, I do not wear frilly dresses and patent leather shoes. But every Sunday, that's what it was. And in Sunday school, we were taught to pray by folding our hands together and bowing our heads. That's how we were taught as kids, right? That's how you were taught to pray, by folding your hands and bowing your head. Now, my grandmother's form of prayer was a little bit different. My grandmother lived with us. As, as a child, and every night when I would go and, and tell my grandmother good night, I would find her on her knees by her bedside. And she would be literally praying out loud to God, and I would join her on my knees listening to her prayer. That's how my grandmother prayed. That's how she taught me to pray, kneeling by my bed at night, talking to God just like I'm talking to you. Who taught us to pray? A prayer is one of the most integral parts of our world as, our, as believers, right? We have private prayer. We, we, we have corporate prayers in worship. We have two intercessory prayer groups in our church. We pray before meals. We pray before we go to bed. We pray when we get up. We know we should pray. But few of us know how we really should do it. One of life's greatest mysteries, isn't it? Some struggle because we don't know how prayer works. Some see it as a type of persuasion. 
at its lowest form, prayer is a wish list that we expect God to fulfill. It's kind of a checklist that, that we want God to, to just give us what we want. But at its highest form, prayer merges us into experiencing God's love as we are immersed and experienced into God's presence. Here's another question for you. How did you learn the Lord's We just prayed it. We pray it every Sunday. Y'all don't even need the words anymore. They're not printed in the bulletin. So the question is, how did you learn it? How did y'all learn it? Church, school? Who learned it in school? It was taught in public school? I'm not sure if I learned it in school. I, I, I seriously... I've been going back in my head this week. I can't remember where I learned the Lord's Prayer. It's just been, it's been in my head for so long, I can't remember not knowing it. Does that make sense? Maybe we learned it in church. Maybe we learned it in school. Maybe we learned it from our parents and our grandparents, the same people who taught us to pray. In Great Britain, the Archbishop of Canterbury thinks that the Lord's Prayer should be taught in school. To this day, he thinks that the Lord's Prayer should be taught in school. And this is why. Because in a survey says that they surveyed 1,000 adults, and 92% of the adults knew the Lord's Prayer. That's pretty good odds, right? 92%. But they also surveyed 1,000 children. How many children do you think knew it? 55%. That's not too great of an odd, is it? 55%. So the Bishop of Canterbury thinks that the Lord's Prayer should be taught in school when the children are young, where they can learn it, when they can can really be immersed in it. And, And a scholar that I was reading earlier this week, is it really all important to know the words of the Lord's Prayer? I think it is. Because it's the framework of prayer as we talk to God. Now, I understand in Jesus' time, the pagan world was not unfamiliar with prayer. They had long, complicated prayers marked by uncertainty. But the Jewish form of prayer was a little bit different. They had short, powerful prayers that would, had been said three times every day, the morning, the afternoon, the evening. No nation at the time had a higher higher ideal of prayer than the Jewish nation did. But the danger of the Jewish prayers was that the formalism could cause the prayers to just slip off the tongue with very little meaning. Think about that for a minute. That you could know the prayer so well that the words could just slip off the tongue without knowing it. Does it sound familiar? Maybe the Lord's Prayer? That we have become so familiar with those words that we don't have to look at them. We don't have to open the hymnal. We've got to memorize. But the question is, do we believe them? Do we trust them? Or are they words that uh, we just say because they're a part of our worship? 
They're included as a liturgical component of our worship every Sunday. But do they have meaningful relevance? Or are they just something that we do? Nearly everybody in this sanctuary can, can recite the Lord's Prayer. We took a poll in here, we'd probably be at 90% or greater. But maybe the question is, can we really pray it? Not can we recite it, but can we really pray it? See, the Lord's Prayer in Scripture is found in, in two different places. We just read the one in Matthew. There's a short version as it's found in Luke 11. In Matthew, this is found within the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus' longest sermon that is kind of uh, gives the basics for belief as disciples. In Luke, Jesus gives uh, the sermon, uh, the, um, gives the Lord's Prayer as a response to the question. Jesus' uh, disciples come to him and, and say, teach us how to pray. And Jesus goes in to giving them the words of the Lord's Prayer. But in Matthew, as we've seen, Jesus doesn't go straight into teaching us how to pray. He teaches us first how not to pray. He first says, don't do it to be seen. Don't pile up meaning, meaningless phrases. See, Jesus in Matthew, as we've already read, provides a framework for prayer. No magic words, just conversation with God. First half of the prayer is all about God. It's God-centered. God comes first. And all the others, they follow. I want us to look at the words. They, they actually have been conveniently written for you after the, the title of the message. The first half of the Lord's Prayer. Have, have, have been written there in your bulletin just in case you need them. Just in case. First half of the prayer is all about God. Addressed to God is Father. And for the Jews, knowing God went back to God's rescue from Egypt. God is not an it, but a personal relational. God is, is personal. God is intimate. God is honest and, and God can be trusted. God cares for us. And, and calling God Father is, is not something that is, is, uh, is just our Father. It's not an exclusive possession. But it's something that that is saying that God delights in all of His children. That God is, is the Father of, of all people. See, the Lord's Prayer points to the character of God. Not only is God our Father, but God is in heaven. The love and the power of God are put in heaven. And we have some fancy words to mean in heaven. In the Greek, some fancy words meaning transcendent, meaning outside or beyond the world, not limited by the physical world. It shows us that God is not just up there and out there, but God is very far yet very near to us. God is in heaven, but is very near when we pray. God is near. Hallowed be your name is, is a phrase that gives reverence to God, meaning let your name be held holy. Talks about that holiness of God, the hayos, meaning different or set apart. Basically is, is saying let God's name be treated then, uh, differently than any other name. 
than all other names. Let God's name be given a position of all other names be given. It's totally unique. Holy keeps us from falling into a cheap sentimentality about God. Because He's intimate. He's our creator. Praise thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of those words point to the spiritual reign of God. Your kingdom come points to the fact that God is sovereign. God is that has the ability to exercise his will, his power, has unlimited uh, power and is independent of the world. But the catchphrase for me in, in, this, in this phrase, if I'm being honest, is this next phrase, your will be done. We're seeking God's will to be done, not our own. The purpose of prayer is not to get everything we want, but for God's will to be accomplished. I remember praying this prayer with a group in a, in a church that I was at in Knoxville. It was the night before um, a, a very stressful surgery of a, of a baby that was going to be born with a heart defect. And this congregation asked, what happens if we don't want God's will? It's a hard question, isn't it? What happens if we don't want God's will? What happens if we want our will? This prayer is a hard one to pray if we're taking it very, very seriously. Sometimes I, get, I choke up on these words if we're praying it serious. But friends, when we're praying this seriously, we're praying God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for the kingdom of God to become fully present on earth for God's will to be done. Yeah, the first half of the prayer has a lot to teach us about God. That God is transcendent. He's in heaven. He's outside, beyond the world. He's not limited by the physical world of this earth. It teaches us that God is holy. That God is higher than any other name that we know. And it teaches us the sovereignty of God. The ability to exercise power, unlimited, not limited by the physical world. See, this prayer is all about God's reliability. And all people would come to honor the name of the Lord. God would establish the fullness of God's reign. This prayer is sometimes called the disciples. For only on the lips of a disciple can this prayer have the full meaning. Only on the lips of a disciple can these words be prayed by those who know what they're saying. But friends, I challenge you to look at these words as they are printed here in your board. We're going to pray these words together this morning. We're going to pray them slowly. We're just going to pray this first half. We're not going to pray the whole one, the whole prayer. We're just going to pray the words that are printed under the message. But as we pray them slowly this morning together, I pray that you would take them seriously, that you would take them reverently, and that these would be words that you take to heart. That you are willing to pray in your own life. So may we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. God, we are your people. And you are our God. We place our lives, our church, our community into your hands. Asking for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us this day, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, we're going to close today's service by singing hymn number 528, Near My God to Thee. Would you stand as you're able? I pray that as you leave this place today, 
that you would know the God that is close to you, that walks with you every step of this journey this week. Go this day in peace. Amen. Amen.